Well, welcome everyone to the fourth webinar of the Fundamentals of Restorative Justice series hosted by the South Carolina Restorative Justice Initiative, or SCRJI. As you all know, my name is Aparna Polavarapu. I'm the executive director and founder of SCRJI, as well as an associate professor of law at the University of South Carolina School of Law. So I wanna remind you of a few items. Most of you have heard this by now, but I'm gonna just say it again. Um, you will see that you're able to chat with panelists only. Chat is being monitored by Torres, who is ensuring that technology runs smoothly. Other attendees cannot see this chat. Panelists will not be reading the chat. So if you have questions, please, please, please post them to the Q&A and you'll see a Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen if you want the moderator and myself to see it. That being said, South Carolina bar members who are seeking CLE credit, you must keep an eye on the chat. Um, you will be prompted every 15 minutes to submit your SC bar number. You must do this so that we can certify your continued presence in this webinar to the Commission on CLE. We plan on sending out surveys at the conclusion of the eight weeks, but are interested in any additional feedback you might offer. So if you have any immediate thoughts at the end of this webinar, we are gonna post a link in the chat where you can send those. Um, and we'll also, that link will also be visible on the password protected page of the website when we post the recording. We do have two ASL interpreters. Um, so please uh, spotlight them, them if you can't see them at any point and you need their services. Uh, we also have live captioning. To access live captioning, please click on the CC icon on your Zoom screen. Okay, I'm joined today by uh, Sonia Shah, who is the director of the Ahimsa Collective, and by Mary Koss, who was the principal investigator of the Restore program. They're both also um, uh, professors, but they're here today uh, due to their roles in both of those uh, programs. So, um, of course, more speaker, more information about them is included in the speaker bios on the website, so feel free to, to check out more information. Both of them are here today to discuss restorative responses to sexual harm. So because of the nature of the discussion um, and the details we might end up discussing, I want to remind you all that this webinar is being recorded and posted for a limited time on the website. If you need to, to take some time to step away, uh, I encourage you to do so and you can return to this at a later time when you feel ready. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to both Sonia and Mary by asking you to talk about your work um, and how you've implemented restorative responses to sexual harm. And Sonia, why don't we start with you? This is, where, this is the start of my 20 minutes, right? You want, me, you want me to start now? Okay, great. Hey, everyone. It's really great to be here. I'm excited to talk with y'all today. Um, my name is Sonia Shai. Five years ago, I started an organization called the Ahimsa Collective, and Ahimsa, Ahimsa is a Sanskrit word that means do no harm. Um, and I come to this from, a, you know, many, many layers of places, but one is a very personal place. Um, as a survivor of sexual harm as a child, um, my parents immigrated to uh, the U.S. when I was really small, uh, from to, to, to the small little village of Manhattan, and um, didn't really know how to kind of navigate a, a tough city. Um, and in that inability to navigate it, you know, was, ex was exposed to early child sexual abuse. Um, I spent many years of my childhood kind of confused and honestly terrified and uncertain. Um, and when I got to my college years, I, I started to remember and realize what had happened. And, and it started my own kind of lifelong journey into this work. Um, and I really found my light in the darkness and in a really dark place. And, you know, it's been, I'm 47. So, you know, 30 years of continual light, opening the light and healing and um, really doing a lot of deep sort of processing around sexual harm. Um, and so I wanna, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the work that we do. So we do, do so much in the field of RJ and sexual harm. And we kind of work along this continuum of 
doing a restorative process that comes what we call RJ in the community or RJ off the grid or has nothing to do with calling the police. It's people who are reaching out because they just want to really work with the harm um, that's happening outside of any system. So we have uh, in the last year, especially really developed sort of that capacity. We do a lot of deep healing and accountability work with people who've done sexual harm, who are inside California state prisons. And so this is like in the continuum of harm, a lot of people don't talk about it so much in this way, but like extreme rape or chronic child sexual abuse is not the same thing as groping and they have different responses. And we have to really, really think about what it means when we're talking about doing rape or child sexual abuse um, and how you really understand that, become accountable for it um, and how survivors heal from that. I kind of want to echo what Aparna said about like, this is really difficult content. And like, I think my whole life is a trigger warning. So everything I'm going to say is going to be possibly triggering. So I really want folks at any point along the way, you know, to just take care of themselves because we are using words like rape and child sexual abuse um, because those are the things that we're talking about and we have to actually say them out loud in order to be able to talk about them. Um, and then we do uh, uh, something called victim offender dialogues. It's a horrible word. I just call them VODs. Um, and they're face-to-face -face dialogues with people who've done harm, um, who are in a prison setting and survivors who reach out. And I'm gonna kind of focus a little bit more um, I'm talking about sort of the accountability piece in the work that we do inside with folks who've done sexual harm. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the VOD program and kind of working with survivors. And all of this stuff that we do is really like, I, I mean, honestly, like a five day training in each one of these things. So it's just kind of high level scratching the surface. Um, so I'm going to share my screen for a sec and uh, we're going to get to this thing and I'm stalling to get to the place where I want to go. And now we're here. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that I would, would not underestimate um, is, wow, this is kind of just coming up funny. Um, we don't want to do it like that. We want to do it from here. Okay, cool. People can see this. Aparna, you can see it okay? Just sort of let me know. Can you not see my slides? I can't see your slides. Oh, that's so weird. Okay, well, I'm going to start this over again. Let's see okay. if we can see them now. I'm going to start it again. Stop share. Let's let me try this again. Um, can you see like this weird thing coming up right now of just my dashboard? Yes. Okay, so now can you see the slides? Still can't see the slides. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, that's unfortunate. Um, well, let's do this. I'll just I'll just kind of talk, but know that there were slides and um, and if maybe you that's the way. Yeah, if you want to send them to me, I can um, post them for people to look at later. If you yeah, can. why don't I send them to you? And and even if you are able to screen share them, then then that's cool. We'll do that. We'll do, I'm just going to talk about them. I think that would be better in okay. the same time. I think that's fine. So I think one of the things that happens right away is that. Um, you know, when we do this kind of work, like we don't, first of all, don't underestimate like the values that we all co-create to work with folks that are survivors or people who've done harm. So our, our organization is made up of everyone from ages 29 to 73, of every ethnicity and gender, you know, that you can imagine. And we have spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to really kind of be a group of people that mirror um, folks that might be in this process. We're also like always forefronting agency and choice and a person's ability to figure out um, what they need and who they are without imposing any kind of framework um, of who they need to be. Um, and, and, and that's not something to underestimate. There are so many programs out there that are really kind of dictate certain models that actually end up being quite racist, to be honest, because they're not very culturally sensitive. And we're not saying that what matters are people and their own healing and how they come to accountability or healing. Um, and that's what has to matter first. So we do a lot to set up sort of our values um, and, and kind of forefront those values. We also really feel like 
it's so important that we walk our talk. So we do a lot of work in ourselves. We have this saying that you can only go as deep with someone as willing as you are to go with yourself. So, um, so if you are not willing to go to hard places, how can you expect other people to go to those places too? Um, and if I were to break down sort of like, what is accountability or what are the elements of accountability when we're doing this kind of work, I would say some of the most important things are self-awareness. I'm um, really like a deep sense of trying to be in um, like a kind of place of self-reflection um, and critical self-reflection kind of all the time. Um, a commitment to try to sort of understand why. Um, why did I do what I, why did I do what I did? Um, trying to understand what remorse is. Um, a desire to make things right to the extent that you can, and that's a very questionable thing and not dependent on you. Um, accountability is like super like a lifelong practice. It's not just like, I got it, I've reached it, I'm there, I'm done. It's a real, real lifelong practice. Um, and we have this saying that we use, which is like finding right-sized accountability. And so if you imagine that there's a spectrum here, and on this side is like denial, and on this side is like this sense of like over apology, which tends to be a shame spiral. Finding accountability is sort of somewhere on that spectrum, right? People can be often in total denial, which is I didn't do it. What are you talking about? Victim blaming. That wasn't me. And then they can shame spiral and oh, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I can't believe I did that. I'm the worst person in the world. And shame spiraling is really about like, being overridden by shame, you know, often having kind of like a lack of self-worth and not even being able to kind of get out of the overwhelming sense of shame. Um, and that's not accountability either, even though people might think that it is. So how do we get to accountability? So a couple things is that the first thing is that like healing and accountability are really deeply linked. So like this, there's this common linkage between unprocessed trauma and like the the action of violence right and that's that common saying that you've probably heard a million times that hurt people hurt people so to understand the cause of the cause of the cause of why we did what we did is to understand the cause of the cause of the cause or many causes of what happened to us and it's not to be underestimated that those really have to go hand on hand without minimizing the actual harm that you've created and so there's a big digging into shame and guilt and the loss and grief in one's life, the role of addiction, um, unprocessed trauma, environmental trauma, structural racism, power and control, just all of, there's so many things that really have to get dug into. Um, and so we do this like over a really long process with people who've done harm and sexual harm. When we're adding sexual harm, it's also digging into patriarchy and rape culture and male socialization and the normalization of like degrading women and girls. Um, and then really just understanding that none of these, no cause is ever like singular. They're really complex and they're really individualized. So people come to it in themselves. Um, so a couple other things about accountability, I would say is that it's really like coming to accountability is really allow ourselves a place to addressing like separately our own like traumas or the reasons why we might be like acting out in certain ways and the actual accountability itself. So separately addressing trauma and accountability. Um, we have a thing that we say in our work about separating the person from the action. So it's not that you are a horrible monster, it's that you did a terrible thing. And there's a pretty big separation between getting trapped in an identity um, of being always the quote unquote offender. So part of the reasons that why we don't use the word victim and offender, not only is it kind of offensive for many folks, it traps them in a place of saying you are once a victim, always a victim, once an offender, always an offender. So person that harmed, people who did harm is kind of the chosen words that we use. Um, uh, many people feel that once that they have empathy for themselves, they, have, they are um, more likely to have empathy for others, right? So there's this mirroring process of if you've never been seen or heard in your own life, um, it's really difficult to see and hear other people. Um, and so 
just this process of being empathized with that can create a sense of accountability. Um, and, you know, we pay a lot of attention to uh, the structural harms and inequities that bring someone to the place where they cause interpersonal harm in the first place. So what are all the underlying structural conditions that put you in the place um, where you might have caused like this interpersonal harm? So there's um, so many things that go into looking at accountability, things that get in the way of being accountable. I would say like number one thing is shame. Shame is huge. Um, shame is scary. Shame is terrifying. We, want, we don't want to have anything to do with our shame. We want it to go away and it will block our ability to be accountable. Um, unprocessed trauma. Um, a general culture that we have of having a lack of self-reflection, not having this culture where we go, oh, shoot, something happened. I might have done something. Let me really think about it. How did I impact that person? How am I feeling right now? What's going on right now? Um, what do I need to do differently? So we don't have this culture of really being self-reflective. Um, a negative sense of our own self-worth. Um, a lot of like sort of black and white thinking and belief systems, like it is either this or that. You're either good or bad. You're either a, someone who's harmed somebody or someone who's been a victim. Um, a, oppression and just, you know, a, a sense of chronic like unhealthy choices over time. Um, and then I, I would say just by ending this little piece on accountability, I would say like just thinking about the impacts of accountability um, is that it really is incredible. Like it's, an, it's a gift, you know, accountability is this like radical way of saying that we want to try to be in connection to humanity, um, that we're not giving up, um, that we are choosing connection over disruption, even if the other, party doesn't want to. Um, and it has this incredible capacity to heal all the parties involved, to create new senses of, of oneself, um, to create a sense of um, beloved relationships and belonging, um, to be incredibly liberating. I've, I've heard so many people who have said, who have come into like really deep accountability, have said that it's been one of the most freeing and liberating experiences to actually own the harm that they caused. Um, and I will say from personal experience of trying to be accountable, the times that I've been the most honest about when I've harmed somebody to them and to myself are the times that I come into a more deeper relationship with myself. So, and that feels very freeing. So um, that's kind of what I wanted to say about accountability. Um, so when we do this work inside prisons and with people outside who've done sexual harm, and we do it in the spectrum of sexual harm from child sexual abuse and rape to like, um, you know, to sexual assault, um, to, to, to just sort of sexual words, right? So it's sort of verbal abuse kind of thing. Um, we basically follow a kind of arc in our own work when we're trying to work towards accountability for someone who's done harm. And that's, going with starting and always starting with building relationships and trust, um, building a sense of our values, understanding like that we're not judging to, to get rid of what it means to be punitive in ourselves and in our hearts is coming to a place that is incredibly non-judgmental. Even when I'm hearing the most difficult things, it's not about how I feel about it, it's about supporting the other person. I can have my feelings and express them to somebody else later. Um, and then we go through like talking about trauma and healing, talking about what accountability is, doing a lot of exercises. And then we go through talking about shame and working with shame. And then we go through a whole arc of looking at gender socialization and patriarchy and understanding sort of male socialization and gender socialization. And then we talk about committing harm, um, and surviving harm and really getting into sort of the nitty gritty of causes of why people might commit sexual harm. Um, we bring in a lot of survivors um, who are survivors of sexual harm and a lot of the research out there is all about how that is one of the most impactful experiences in the restorative process and people really understanding accountability. Um, and then we talk about healthy relationships and finding those boundaries. So that's kind of our sort of arc. 
Um, Aparna, how much time do we have left? Like about six minutes, five minutes? Okay. So um, I'm just going to shift gears a little bit and move to just talking a little bit about like um, the, VOD, the VODs that we do. So for the past, we've done maybe 40 or 50 VODs. These are face-to-face -face dialogues in the last couple of years. Um, these are victims that reach out to the Office of Victim Services in the state of California for a process. People are incarcerated um, for the harm they caused. And the Victim Services does a quick scan of where these folks are. And um, once they're kind of just in a good place, they send that case or that dialogue to, to one of four community organizations and we're one of them. And I tend to do a bunch of the sexual harm ones because that's where my interest lies. So before COVID, I was working on about five and they were all very, very different. And um, what I want to say the most about a face-to-face -face dialogue is that um, it is incredibly individual. Um, it's incredibly deeply relational with the facilitators. Um, and it's really motivated um, so much time for survivors for the desire to heal more, that this is a place that they want in their healing path and their healing journey. Um, they want to hear the truth from the person that harmed them. They want to hear remorse. They want to know why they did it. They want questions answered that only that person can answer. Um, they want to be reassured that the harm won't happen again. Um, and there's a desire to share the impact, basically, of how this person has impacted their lives. Um, and um, what I would say has been, I just want to kind of talk about one for the last like four minutes. Um, I worked on this one VOD for two years um, from start to finish with a woman who was a survivor of child sexual abuse chronically when she was a child from eight to 14. And the person who did the harm um, has been incarcerated for about 10 years. Um, right away, it was really, really clear that her, her PTSD uh, in life was so big that we had to be really, really precise with her about when we were communicating and how we were gonna communicate in, in order to build trust. Um, she was an immigrant, she was Latina, I'm South Asian, and you know we could automatically kind of connect about language, about not being from here, about sort of things that were, um, uh, things that were familiar. And so those really built points of connection for us. Uh, my co-facilitator was also South Asian, um, and the person who did harm was also uh, a Mexican immigrant. So although we weren't exactly the same ethnicity, it really mattered, and there was a lot of trust, because we were always interweaving things about race, um, and it never like was a thing that we were talking about it. Um, she, what was most important about this process was her sisterhood. She needed us to be, like we needed to be kind of in sisterhood with her. So we would text at random, we would talk about kids, we would talk about a lot of other things just because that made her really comfortable and it really, really built a relationship. Um, even though in our process, we, we offer and ask people if they want to write, you know, things down and share them. It's a way a lot of people process, you know, how they want to come to a dialogue. She hated writing. <laughs> she never wanted to write anything down. Um, so it was all very oral. So we really like, you know, we met with this person over two years, probably at least like 14 times. Uh, we met with the person inside about seven times and then they were kind of ready to have this conversation. And each time was a little key into like, what needed to happen next and how we were meant to be in relationship with her and how we were meant to be with the person inside. Um, so much of our work was helping her to move from a place of being kind of reactive to a place of being proactive. So a lot of our early conversations were like, well, and when he says this, I'm going to say that. And when he says this, I'm going to say that. And there was this moment I really remember kind of halfway through the process, I was like, wow, she's still the person who's not in control. And so we, we had a really big conversation about what would it mean if you get to lead the conversation, if you actually get to start it, if you get to dictate what you're gonna say, and then he has to really you know, think about how he's going to um, respond to you. So that was a really big piece of learning. Um, and I'm just highlighting a few pieces of learning because, again, this would be like a four-day training. 
Um, and just a couple other things were that, um, you know, she was really pissed. Um, this was her stepfather. By the, by the way, I have permission to share all of this with you. And she would love to talk to anybody who wants to learn more, basically. That's kind of the person that she is now. Uh, but she was really, really pissed. And she wasn't in forgiveness. And there was never any pushing of that. And I remember one time she said to me, um, we were in the middle of a conversation. She said, Sonia, you know, you think like if I'm just sitting there, I could just like get up and like smack the shit out of him across the table? <laughs> and I said, mm, yeah, I mean, I said, so like you can think that and you can even tell him that, but you can't do it. And we started laughing, right? And there was something about validating that I just want to smack the shit out of him that was like so great, right? It wasn't saying like, oh no, we don't do that in perfect, beautiful RJ land. And we don't say curse words and we don't have these feelings. We do, we have all these feelings. We say all these things and we just really own it. And then, you know, we can say, well, what can we actually do in the moment? And I wanna say that when we got into that room and I'm intentionally just in my last minute staying focused on him because I taught her, because I talked a lot about people who have done harm and I wanted to spend some time with survivors is that when we got into that room, you know, she ended up bringing two years of his board transcripts with her and going through point by point every single thing he said at the board and asking questions and really taking control. And um, at one point she wrote me a note and was sitting there and she said, she wrote in the note, oh my God, his food looks like dog shit. You know, can I give him a part of my sandwich? And I was like, no, you can't give him a part of your sandwich. And, but what was so beautiful about that was that in that moment, what she was saying is I can see his humanity and I care about the food that he's eating right now. Um, and I don't want him to not eat good food, right? And it wasn't, and it was this, there was a transformation and alchemy of the feeling in the moment from being like, you know, I just want to smack the hell out of him to like, I really care about what he's eating. And in the end of the day, after, you know, our many hours, we think we did a five hour dialogue of sitting there and uh, incredible process. You know, she, a few weeks later did end up writing him a very long letter and had come to her own sense of forgiveness, but had a lot of requests of him to now tell his family what he'd done. So he was still not off the hook uh, around his own accountability. Um, and just the last thing is he just, you know, there's so many things I could say about his process and what he went through, but we worked with him. Um, he was both in one of our groups. Luckily, we were able to get him in a group of ours. And he had done a lot of work on himself, and we worked with him a lot over time. Um, but he just showed up in the most incredible, um, accountable way that he could in the moment. Um, and I, he expressed afterwards, like this, just this huge, um, this huge weight that came off of his shoulder. I will stop there. And there's a million more things today. I'm sure Mary's going to enlighten you with so many of them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mary, would you um, like to talk about your work as well? Well, we can't hear you. You have to unmute. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Mary Koss. Um, my licensed psychologist number is 1416. I would like CE credits because I got audited this year. <laughs> and I was saved by COVID because they said, we understand you can't get to your office to get the actual records. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate uh, the, what everyone is going through, putting their numbers in. Um, I'm going to put some slides up. And hopefully I have better luck. Um, so let's see how we do. There you go. Um, you can see these now? Good. So I would like, Sonia and I have so many observations in common even though we work in um, different settings, our programs are in different settings, they both involve face-to-face. -face. And uh, so I think you'll find a certain uh, continuity. 
I would like to say right up front that when you go on the website, you'll find a set of frequently asked questions. It looks just like this set of slides, but it is called Frequently Asked Questions. It's co-authored by Quince Hopkins, who is a law professor at the University of Maryland. Because for all the attorneys in the, in the audience, I do want you to realize that um, you, I, that I know you have many questions, that this work raises a huge number of issues that um, have to be solved legally. I did not uh, do that myself um, through unpracticed of the law. I did have a partner working with me. So you'll, you will um, have access to at least our responses to some of the legal, legal questions that this work raises. Now what I'm gonna, I, before I started this program, I was finishing a two-year project where we were following rape victims from the time of the rape through two years of their recovery. And what we were most interested in is like, what did they think about during that time? I mean, what, like what, evol what evolves in your thought process um, in, 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 as you look back, as you look forward, as it impacts on the way you see the world, the way you see yourself, that's the main focus of what, um, what I was doing. Then I got this um, award that said uh, it was th that I contributed to public policy. And I thought, oh my God, I have to give an address about public policy. And I'm not sure that recovery from rape, ha it, you know, how I'm gonna make that into a public policy. So this is a project that actually came from a nightmare. And I'm gonna show you a picture of, that was my nightmare. I woke up, this is one of the biggest nightmares I've ever had in my life, was waking up to this huge auto accident. And this was um, a lower level of my consciousness giving me um, what subsequently became the answer, which was I realized the findings from the, the study we were doing showed that um, what is the most harmful for victim recovery is part of the essential components of how the criminal justice system, or you could say the conventional justice system operates. Here I've just highlighted two things. Um, I mean, one of the very first things that happens after rape that victims ask themselves is whose fault it is. And the even when they conclude to a certain percentage that it was other person, the person that did it, um, any kind of blame of you is not really helpful for recovery and it changes the way you look at the world. And because every ongoing experience gets interpreted by the way you look at the world, the template you have, it's a very long lasting effect. So how does that interact with conventional justice that's focused on assigning blame? It's focused on questioning that is inherently provocative of self-blame. Self and then I have a few other points that I'm sure you're all aware of, which is you're putting victims through this awful car accident. And honestly, the performance statistics are so poor, there's no way you can justify this. We did survey the people who participated in our program uh, because we wanted to know their motivations for seeking a restorative alternative that was made available to them by prosecutors. Um, and we were a program operated outside of law enforcement, but we received our referrals from prosecutors. These letters stand for survivor victim, and they, they, they were most, you know, they, they, altruism turned out to be a very high motivation um, that, uh, but, the, but it wasn't the biggest one. Um, the biggest one was, well, maybe you could twist it into it. They wanted to hold the re responsible person, the wrongdoer, accountable. 
but they wanted to do that in a way that wasn't carceral. And they wanted a chance to say this is, they wanted an impact statement. For the responsible people, they wanted an alternative to having to go to court and they wanted to apologize. And FF stands for family and friends. And the family and friends wanted different things as number one, depending on who they were. The survivor victim family and friends wanted the wrongdoer to be held accountable. And the family and friends of the, uh, of the responsible person wanted uh, to avoid a court process. Now, uh, I hope you can see this. My gallery is uh, obscuring this. The, they have used uh, what is called restorative justice conferencing. And I'm gonna explain that more in a minute. In Australia and New Zealand for many years, but only for sexual assault of, among juveniles and mo most of that involved siblings. Um, the, the, you cannot take the model off the shelf that they used in Australia and just say, let's do the same thing for adult sexual assault survivors. I laid out here some of the, there's about 39 concern, concerns when you count them all up, uh, but I laid out the most important ones that we had to think about as we design this program that we are going to implement and we're also going to evaluate what do we have to do to make sure that this program that we are account we are accountable to the advocates in the community who fear we're doing harm and then the other column uh, has to do with the responsible person and the responsible person we also have to be accountable to the advocacy community who is concerned we let people off too easy but we also had legal, legal rights, including constitutional rights. And, and that's, that's a pretty important thing to, uh, to solve. Our RESTORE program, as I said, received referrals from a prosecutor's office. The, the uh, referral and consent stage involved uh, Finding people, we went to victims first because no one should be coerced into having to participate in this type of uh, program. So victims had to say if it was okay with them, we tracked down the wrongdoer. And if they both consented, we had a stack of forms because we had to do, uh, I don't even want to tell you, look at the frequently asked questions to find out what we had to do to satisfy human subjects and legal um, issues. But once we got people referred and consented, then we entered a preparation period. The preparation period was a variable length of time, depending on what, you know, what, what was needed. Some cases that there was not a face-to-face -face meeting desired. And in those cases, preparation was shorter. Well, um, when it was, we wanted to make sure that the victim had gotten to the point in her recovery that she had the ability to control her emotions and wouldn't be humiliated by breaking down, be unable to talk. Um, although there was a representative designated uh, in case that did happen. Um, the perpetrator, the wrongdoer, we had to make sure that uh, they had gotten to the point where they understood they were taking responsibility. And that meant no going back, no talking about how she was dressed, any of that uh, stuff. The, point of why you're there is you're going to say what you did and you're going to take responsibility for what you did and then you're going to become party to a redress plan that is what you are going to do uh, to repair harm and to rehabilitate yourself. The conference period was actually the shortest because that was just the actual meeting that brought people together. And then the longest period was the supervision and reintegration. That, does, that process did involve the victims to the extent that they have the rights to be present whenever you're holding a community board meeting 
um, to, uh, to focus on the case of their uh, wrongdoer. However, um, we, we found on, that our victims, when the conference was over, they were finished. And although they were notified, they did not want to have any further contact. Um, the, so the supervision and reintegration period really was 12 months spent um, ensuring that the responsible person carried out their redress plan. Here's some, you know, some random facts that I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna read to you, but it'll answer some of your questions like, why did the process take the amount of time it did? Well, we want, um, we want um, you know, the time the other person talked to be subtracted from our time because it took um, uh, three months and up to one year as an outlier to actually get referrals into our program for it to go through investigation, go through prosecution and get to us. So that, that our program um, length was extended by how, in, from the victim's perspective, how long it took to get judgment, justice was extended by how long it took to get to us. Um, you might be interested that three quarters of the um, felony victims did want a face-to-face -face conference. I'd be glad in our question period to come back and answer any more of, you know, expand on any more of these points. We had um, a number of requirements to be in our program. Um, like it was only people over 18. It was only first offenses. It was sexual crimes that happened outside the context of domestic violence. We did, did this is so important to emphasize, we did not do domestic violence. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't do domestic violence, but we wanted to start with less complex and intermesh um, programs. So the, the rest of the things listed here are what the responsible person had to do during that year that uh, we, we were, we were um, checking in and making sure we were only keeping a person in the community who was safe, that if they were not safe, they would go back. Um, we did uh, a number of uh, qu quantitative assessments of people who took part in the program. And so I just summarized a few uh, findings here that, uh, that there were a number of dimensions on which the survivor victims were 100% uh, satisfied. And that's pretty amazing. I'm sure that anyone could in the justice process would say that's pretty amazing for um, something that had to do with a rate uh, had to do with sex crimes and was talking about victims did uh, was justice done i mean the interesting thing about what whether justice was done was that the largest group that disagreed were the group of people when the victim did not want to appear herself we used a victim representative and those were often advocates who had been victimized themselves and they were actually the least satisfied. But even for them, we felt this was an accomplishment because they were on, only only thirty percent of them felt justice was not done. So we, we felt we made some converts. Um, you would expect responsible people, to a certain extent, not to be satisfied with the justice to, uh, process. But um, it's you know it's kind of interesting. The wrongdoers themselves were. Uh, eight out of 10 were satisfied, but it was the fa their family and friends uh, were the largest single uh, highest rate of dissatisfaction and for us coming after their loved one, I guess. Um, this uh, is the is a just a pie chart of the outcomes of the program. So we, we had 80% of our participants complete and uh, for some reason, this little thing, I don't know whether I have to hit it again or, you know, what now. I, I don't know. There's supposed to be numbers there, but there's got to be a te technological flaw or it's not a real Zoom presentation. Anyway, 80% of the people completed all 12 months of the program. And then you can see the other slices of the pie for those who terminate. If you didn't complete, what did you do? Did you withdraw, terminate? 
were you terminated by us, by our community board, because we invested in the community representatives the decision about whether this person needed, go, needed to uh, go back to prosecutors was no longer safe in the community, and then who reoffended. Um, this is the last slide that I'm going to show, and it, it, I'm speaking particularly to uh, advocates here because there's really serious safety concerns about bringing people face to face, uh, not, not only physical safety, but also psychological safety. Uh, and, and this, we, we actually use a standardized psychological test to measure post-traumatic stress disorder and use public norms that, that are for rape crisis centers. So I want you to see two things from this chart. Um, you know, one thing is that justice is not a silver bullet um, psychologically, and nor, nor should it be because justice is for justice. It's not for giving psychotherapy. Um, but I think if you look at this, you can see that it, you can't build a strong case. You can say it didn't do better than therapy, but it didn't do harmful things. It didn't do worse than therapy. So I, I believe that that's the end, Aparna. Um, and I can stop sharing and turn it uh, back to the next phase. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, and just a reminder to all, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A. And I'd like to take moderator's privilege and start with a question. Um, one of the things we've touched on in past webinars, but not really explored, um, that I think Sonia got into a little bit, is how um, restorative justice can reach and adapt to communities who may be feeling excluded or disenfranchised from the system. Um, and these are people who might be excluded for any number of reasons, you know, including uh, race, uh, sexual orientation, immigration status, disability, you know, any other minority status. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. Um, could you talk about how, um, if there's a time that you've used your work to um, work with uh, members of those communities and um, whether you've had to adapt your process at all to work with those members. And I, I'm going to start with you, Mary, since you're unmuted. Okay. Well, thanks. The, um, yes, first of all, I mean, we're in a, we're in a Latinx part of the country. So we did have the ability, all materials, and we could uh, conduct conferences and well, every aspect of the program in Spanish. Um, we uh, didn't have uh, many takers, but we, we, yeah, if we get to do it again, we're all set uh, to go um, in the predominant language of our, of our, uh, our area. We had an American Indian staff member. And so uh, we were prepared for um, any group who wanted a particular ceremony uh, or had um, a, a cultural tradition of how they introduced themselves to each other. And, and we, were, we were trained and prepared to do that. Um, the, we had a third situation that I'd like to mention, and that is that uh, in, this is so understandable in the period of time we're living in right now. We had a, a um, black responsible person who had his, the survivor victim was white. And he had a really strong feeling that he did not want to have his side of the table be African-Americans and her side of the table be uh, Anglo-Americans. So uh, he asked for an all black conference and we were able to, when we had a black, our facilitators were all professionally trained. We ha I had one of our black facilitators and, and then uh, since the victim was white, we asked her permission to have a black victim substitute represent her and she agreed and her father agreed. So we recruited um, someone from the Urban, Urban League to represent her father. And bottom line is that there were no white people at the table. And this was a fascinating conference because it uh, kind of took race off the table in, in, in some ways. Um, 
I, I had only one more at the risk of, you know, dominating. Um, and that is that we did have a case that involved both the a survivor victim and the responsible person were profoundly deaf and used American Sign Language. So we had uh, multiple interpreters at this uh, conference. Now, uh, one thing that was really interesting to the interpreters was that normally they stand so that the uh, uh, person who is communicating with them through sign language can see their gestures in their faces. But it means then that they're not making direct eye contact with the person to whom they want to be directing their impact statement or their statement of responsibility. So um, our interpreters figured out that they would stand behind, for example, when the responsible person was giving his impacts, his statement of responsibility, his interpreter stood behind the victim and she made her gestures higher, high enough in the air that he had to look in the direction of her face to read the signs. So we, um, afterwards, we, we were really, um, we were really satisfied that we came up with a process that incorporated a different uh, language of communication, but also maintained that face-to-face -face aspect of um, looking at each other while speaking. Um, do you want me to also respond to that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I feel like, you know, we, for us, like integrating difference and oppression and, and issues of structural inequity and all of it are, are, are interwoven in every single way we are, what we do, how we be, and that they're not separated out from a kind of process or a program. I don't think, none of us think about what we do as a program. We are with people, um, we are from those people, um, and we're in community with those people. And I think it's a very, very different way of approaching things to be from folks and with folks than to be like, here's the thing I'm offering to folks. Um, here's the thing I'm doing to folks. And um, I will say that then that gets felt throughout, right? Is like when we're approaching it from this place of like, you know, here's the thing, we're with you in it, if you wanna do it, if you don't wanna do it, every step of the way. And when things come up, when people are outraged by the length of their prison terms, which are incredibly inequitable, and they need to talk about it, we are as outraged with them. Um, we create space to be pissed at the system and talk about the system. And we create space to talk about accountability, you know, and we live in this 200 and 300% reality where all of these things can be true at the same time, you know, where we can have incredible, incredible inequity and we can also have interpersonally done harm to others. So I think those are things that are really huge for us. Um, you know, language really matters to us, like not using clinical language, um, not pathologizing folks, not um, using terms that come from outside. Um, that really matters. And I think another thing is we don't really just do something and then leave. We're kind of with people for a really long time. So we've, you know, we have these VODs, but now we have all these survivor groups that are online for anybody who did a VOD who wants to be in one, you know, we have so many things that we try to keep doing um, to stay in community with folks. It was actually like right after I talked about this person, she had texted me two days ago and I was like, oh my God, I didn't text her back. So when Mary was talking, I quickly texted her back because I, I just talked about her and I think about her and I want her to know that she's in my thoughts. Um, and so I think that those are all ways that um, being like, like really, really deeply centered around, um, we are a country of difference. Um, we are a country of difference. And if we're not hyper attuned to that in our microcosm, then I think it's really difficult for us to be attuned to that as, as we grow our circle and do our work. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna ask one other question before um, going to this list. So in, sometimes we hear differing stories 
from uh, the people who are involved, from the person who committed the harm and the person who's been harmed. Uh, can you talk about how uh, you've addressed that when that's come up? Let can me just start again. Go, ahead, Mary. Go yeah. for it. Well, it's a prerequisite, I think, for all forms of restorative justice that the wrongdoer accept responsibility. But I, let, me, let me just tell you, we had a number of uh, people come in uh, for wrongdoing that involved an incapacitated victim. And they were absolutely, I mean, yeah, they acknowledge it happened and they, uh, but they were totally unaware that this was some kind of crime. In fact, we're not really willing to believe it was some kind of crime until we opened the Arizona statutes for them and, you know, said, read, read these two lines right here. And, and so that was when people came to the realization. We had other people whose crimes were captured on videotape. Those are easier. Um, the, you, you were asking about people who don't take responsibility. 27% of the rape uh, felony accusations the people would not take any level of responsibility. They wouldn't even accept, we didn't require them to say, I'm a rapist or I raped somebody, but we did require that they say the incident happened and I did uh, you know, penetrate that woman. Um, kind of an anti-Clinton statement. And um, so those people never even got in the program why the preparation period was so long is that conferences are always forward looking. We had a set of rules that if they were broken, the conference was terminated and the case was returned to prosecutors. And uh, foremost among those rules was that there be no abuse. And there, there's, no, there's no going back and, say, and talking about who drank what, who wore what. I'm talking about what the wrongdoer um, could, could do. And that's why we spent time working on their statement with them so that they would focus on, this is what I did wrong. These were my specific acts. We, we wanted them to have not, we didn't think about it as shame, but some level of shame's inherent in it, of having to say in front of a group of people, this is what I did. This is what I'm taking responsibility. Uh, so I hope that's an answer to what you were getting, getting at, is that we didn't have anybody come to the conference who wasn't at the point of accepting responsibility and at the point of being willing to talk about, to, to hear how it impacted someone else and then talk about how to repair the harm moving forward. And I would say, I'll piggyback a little bit on what Mary said is that imagine this is actually such a great question. Um, so I had, as for me, I had like these four or five dialogues I was working with and they, they literally fell along the spectrum. Um, and I think it's really helpful to think about it like that. Now, of course, like there's on this one side that it's like the person who did harm is like, yes, I did all these things in exactly the way this person I harmed remembered it, which is very rare that that happens, right? Um, and on this end, we have like, I didn't do anything, I didn't do any of those things. Now, in some of the, the dialogues I've been working on, there's this really nuanced place that's been really different. Um, it, it's really important to make okay that that person who's done harm can tell you, the facilitator, anything that they're feeling, right? So if he or she wants to say to me, that's not what I remember. I don't think I did that. I remember it differently, or I didn't think it was that bad. They, it's, it builds trust um, for them to be able to say to me, this is how I'm feeling. Um, and, but the, there's a difference when we're talking about now, when you're sitting face to face with the person that you harmed. So I had a situation where somebody, there was a real difference between the, another sort of stepfather, uncle situation, child sexual abuse, and what they remembered about some actions were really, really different. And we had a lot of conversations about, but he still really wanted to go through with the dialogue, felt a lot of remorse, 
and wanted to just show up and be accountable. But there were these sticking points to him about the, uh, some of the actual actions. And we talked a lot about how much does that really need to be something that you have to clarify or not, right? Like, like do you, does it have to be something that you have to say I'm right and you're wrong? And if that's the case, that's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard to go, go through with this, right? Because we really want to show up with her. And so it was more about a process of thinking about letting go of what he thought his memories were, what she thought her memories were, and how we're going to work with a moment that might come where it might not feel that good, where you remember it differently. And then what are you going to do in that moment when you're starting to feel that way? So that was something that we were working through. Um, there was another situation where the person who had done harm was so adamant that he remembered it a certain way. And that was what happened. So that wasn't going to go through with the dialogue, right? Because he wasn't really centered on like really understanding kind of what the person wanted to communicate who was the survivor. Um, and then there was another situation where in the one that I talked about where the person who did harm really wanted us to know how much he had really still cared for this person, this young child, and how he had done loving things. And, and we had to talk a lot about us hearing that and that being okay, but, you know, did it really matter given all of the horrible things that he did? And really accepting that while he might have felt love, what he did was a lot of abuse. And that those are really complicated feelings and that you have to really grapple with those feelings of, and that we were hearing what he was saying. And as a parent, you know, who uh, he was speaking from the perspective of a parent, as a parent, I could try to identify with him, right? Of like, yeah, like I think I'm doing these things, but my kid thinks that, you know, like, okay, I hear you, you know, you did some things that were like being a parent and then you did some really fucked up shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> that was not okay. And sorry for my cursing, but that's kind of how I show up sometimes, right? But then, I mean, that's kind of how we even talk in the dialogue when we're comfortable. Like, that was not okay, dude, like, you know that, you know, like that was horrible. Like you can't, how do you even talk about the love and I could talk to him like that, like, you know, you realize what you're saying to me. You want her to, you want her to see that you love, she loved you when you did all these things to her. Come on now, you know, let's, let's talk about this. So that was really important to kind of be able to get up across. I apologize if the cursing has offended anybody. Well, I'm fine over here. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn over to some of our um, participant questions. So the first one I see is, this is a really interesting one. Is there a significant difference in these two examples that one is before a sentence and the other is with people who have already been through the criminal justice system? Well, I could probably um, start because we did both felonies and misdemeanors. And so my, the, the answer is both. Um, the felonies were pre-charge diversions and the misdemeanors were, they had um, entered a guilty plea, but their, uh, if they successfully completed the program, their lawyers, please excuse me, I get this language mixed up. The, 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 um, it, it was, it's a V word, you know, anyway, not vindicated, but, uh, all right, I'm not going to struggle with it any longer. They the the um, they left with no um, their case was dismissed with with prejudice with prejudice. Is that how I say it, Aparna? That that was the end. They and their their without prejudice. So they, without prejudice. The yeah, is, yeah, that was the end. Okay. And then they carried no record of conviction for for that. So it, I guess you would call that um, a post-plea diversion, and the other one was a pre-charge diversion. So yeah, I would add, like maybe from a maybe narrative or whatever substance perspective, I think there's a huge difference about doing like restorative process along this continuum, or post-sentencing, post-conviction. We're talking about 10, 15, 20 years out, right? Like people have 
a lot of time to think about kind of like what they did and a lot of the because there's no ramifications for sentencing a lot of it is just like folks are on their healing journey they're trying to like figure out what's next and like a liberation goal um we're doing a lot of stuff that is like now rjn community off the grid and it's this we're, we're kind of creating a place where anybody can reach out to us um, and talk like anyone, like a survivor, a person who's done harm, a witness, bystander, an organization, and we will take their call or their email and we will try to sort of help them figure out what they need. Um, and this is a really kind of interesting place, probably the most important and most needed and cutting edge as we're trying to talk about creating alternatives to the criminal justice system and alternatives to dealing with harm that aren't kind of using state systems and the police and other things like that. So if we're going to do this, what are we going to do? So we're in a process now of saying, we're kind of like documenting like the next year of like, okay, let's say we get these 100, 150 calls or emails or whatever, where are they going? What's happening in them? And I'll tell you after the first three or four months, what we just had a, a big like retreat about it is some of the things that we're seeing is um, one is that people oftentimes just don't even know what restorative justice is and need a lot of clarity about like what the process is. Two, there's a lot of folks um, that just really, like the, the first call is so big for clarifying sort of like, what is it that I actually want? Um, some people need a lot, just really want more therapy. Um, and it's like then about connecting them to like sort of healing workers and therapists. Um, some folks need like legal counsel and it's connecting them there. Um, and then some folks are, are like ready to move into some, some sort of dialogue type situation. And then it's about kind of doing the work to reach out to different parties. Um, a couple other things that we're noticing is that there are people that are reaching out that aren't even really involved and are, are thinking about, well, this is a process I want done over there and to you and you know and so so much of it is about kind of getting anybody with power out of the way and getting directly in touch with the people involved um there's a lot of what some of the facilitators are, have been saying is that there's a lot of time that's needed because th this is like we're talking often about like harm that's just happened or active harm or like you know i'm just ready to start processing there's more time that's needed for people to process and there's more kind of time needed for like the wishy-washiness of like, oh, my life got busy, but now I'm ready to get back to it. So it has a kind of a more chaotic element to it. It's not as structured in those kinds of ways. Um, and, and yeah, and then there's just really sort of, I think, you know, really helping people locate the difference between being like a victim or bystander um, and what their role is and versus being a survivor or being a person who did harm and kind of how we can, how we work with people differently depending on those situations. Thank you. Uh, okay, the, the next question is uh, specific to Mary. When getting the referrals from the prosecutor's office, was that done through a contract with them? Um, what was the agreement between the prosecutor and the responsible? party as far as further prosecution in the future. I think you kind of answered that last one where you said if they successfully completed, they would, um, their record was expunged, right? Yeah, well, the, these are, these are the kind of things that are addressed in the frequently, um, frequently asked questions uh, because uh, they did not, felonies, let's talk about felonies, so they didn't mm -hmm. have to enter a plea so that they could go back if they yeah. failed they could go back and still be charged and have the um, uh, normal process the conventional process i do have to say that of the three people who failed our program um, all were sent back to prosecutors and all were all were handled in the typical way of nothing happened uh, nothing further ha happened Okay. What else was part of that question? It had how several was, um, parts. How did you have a contract with the prosecutor's office? Oh, okay. Well, that? this project was grant funded. And so we had a sub award. It wasn't a lot of money because state workers can't be 
like paid for doing their job, but you also have to recognize that an office incurs expenses mm -hmm. um, when they have to deploy people in different ways to participate in research. So we had a small sub subcontract with them, but it was, uh, they actually hardly billed us anything. Um, they were at the time enthusiastic about doing this program and so considered it, the prosecutors considered it part of their normal duties to figure out which one of these cases might go to a restorative justice approach as opposed to the other choices they have, plea agreements, nothing, trials. Um, and I'd like to ask Sonia a related question, um, because you talked about doing VODs. How did you, how did you convince <laughs> um, authorities to allow you to do that? To actually do the VODs? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think we have a really, really strong statewide effort that's been going on, like, pretty pretty well in the last like seven years but kind of started on informally maybe 15 years ago um we work closely with the office of victim services and they have worked closely with um the the i mean the biggest barrier are the prisons you know in terms of like them allowing us to do them mm -hmm. um, but we they've sort of it's become something that um the state of california prisons kind of like accepts and realizes is important. And I haven't had trouble getting into any of the places that I've been needing to get into, but it took a little while to get there. Um, and a lot of when I talked to the victim services person who did most of the work, she's like, you know, I just had to explain and really like build relationship with the folks in the prison to like explain why we were doing this, what we were doing. Um, there are things that come up that are particularly around sexual harm that are really difficult. Um, they, you know, of people who work, you know, who know more about sort of prison culture that is that people who've done sexual harm are kind of like the lowest end of the totem pole and there's a lot of fear of being found out. And so um, there's a lot of fear when people walk through that door um, about kind of um, sharing and disclosing and who's gonna find out and who's gonna know even within the prison. So that's been a big thing we've had to really work hard on. Okay. Uh, Karna, could yeah. I, I just realized that question had so many parts and I forgot one, yeah. one part of it, which, which was we, we, kept, we did not record our conferences either through notes or other means of recording. We had a written agreement with the misdemeanor judge and a verbal agreement with the district attorney that the county attorney that no uh, nothing discovered during the conference itself would be used um, in any subsequent prosecution, it, with the exception that if there was something exculpatory discovered by us, that we we did agree we had a responsibility to transmit that. We work with police to figure out a way to record participation in restorative justice into the criminal justice statistical database so that uh, the one we had unfortunately one of our reoffenders died but um, an, another an, another one uh, we were able to successfully test that the way it was being recorded in statistics worked uh, they were able to retrieve that the person had participated. Uh, they were able to contact the victim. She did testify in his trial and he was found guilty and uh, incarcerated. Um, just anecdotally though, I'd like to share with you that the victim got back to me several years later and said, um, I'm really scared because my perpetrator is getting out of prison and his attorney told me directly to his, my face in front of him that I was responsible for sending him to prison. And now I'm scared, whereas I wasn't scared of him after going through the Restore program. And I, th I, I thought that was uh, really telling. Um, but the main point is to respond to the questioner that um, about how, how information 
was used or not used and how it was recorded or not recorded. And just to clarify, you felt that that revealed something about the way the types of things that might come out of an adversarial system versus the restore program or? Well, we did not, we didn't want our participants to all get subpoenaed to testify in trials and to be required to talk about what happened in a process that where everyone signed a confidentiality agreement. Right. So that's why it was done. But then the other side of the coin is you don't you also don't want people who to become second third and fourth time offenders and to be continually given the option of participating in a restorative uh, process so that was why it was important to also figure out a way that was not going to stigmatize them as sex offenders mm -hmm. um, when record search background searches were done but on the other hand, if they did reoffend, and they were told in their consent form, if you reoffend, you you give up your confidentiality and you your participation will be um, recoverable by the by the police. Mm -hmm. okay. It just it just it was community safety why we thought that was a, important to not deprive law enforcement. I mean, you know. Law enforcement overbelieves in serial rape. Um, and so you can't tell them, we're going to take somebody off your docket, and then you won't be able to figure out when they, if they do it a second time. Uh, or what if they've done it three more times before they got caught? Uh, so that, that, was, that was the issue. Those were the issues we were having to balance. How not to let out information we didn't want to harm our participants and how to uh, satisfy the police that we were protecting the public from anyone who might who was a repeat offender i see okay yeah so this was um an important step to take to make this happen yes yeah, i see i see what you're saying okay um there was a question that i think sonia wrote a written answer to but i want to ask it for everybody um about structural harm Right. So when trying to address structural harm, especially poverty and economic inequality, is there a plan, e.g. re-entry, that includes community partners who can assist with housing, jobs, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, so I think one of the things about all this work, all of our work, all of our work is that we're never doing enough. Um, and that, like, it feels like we have to be responsible to making those plans. So we we don't have like this formal system of like, we're with someone forever and we help them with every job or every house or everything that they need. But we do, for us, we do really think about like a continuum of support and care and community. And what that looks like, let's say we have like, I don't know, a couple hundred people in our community that are survivors that are formerly incarcerated, you know, not folks necessarily that know each other. Um, we continue on with like survivor groups. We have a lot of our facilitators have a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, relationships with people. Um, you know, we've done a lot of like money sending in times of crisis. Um, we've done a lot of support networking in terms of like finding, um, finding jobs and housing. We're actually about to open our first reentry house for this very reason, because we really feel committed to not just doing like a program thing, but really being there for folks kind of when they get out. Um, we do a lot of like, we do monthly like barbecues and hangouts for formerly incarcerated folks. We're really sort of a, lot, a bunch of our staff are formerly incarcerated. So there's a lot of, it's really much more informal about helping each other out and being in each other's sort of community. Um, and so I, I think that's been a big part of our ethos. Um, and there's this kind of thing where it's like, oh, you're an organization and you do this thing, but this thing doesn't mean anything or it does mean something, but it means more when we have all these other things around it. So I strongly, strongly encourage us all when we're thinking about restorative justice practices or processes that we're not just thinking about the actual like 
harm or the dialogue or the process, but we're thinking about all the things that go around it that are needed to support that person. Can I say something on that point? I, I want to build up something. Um, I don't know if is this is this readable. Um, I hope it's not backwards. Yeah, and no, I, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. We, if you would go on my bio statement that Aparna put up, mm -hmm. there's links. That's a technical report, a policy brief, and the way it was disseminated in the Huffington Post, because. They were specifically asking me in relationship to defunding the police that I think some police money should go to providing restorative justice. And uh, what I elaborate on in this article is we're forgetting to look at VAWA and the extent to which VAWA funds police services and prosecution services. And that's the money that I would like to see us go after to fund restorative justice because the track record for conventional justice is so poor uh, that that restorative justice can't possibly do worse. Um, the, my vision is a wheel where um, at, the, at the hub is the victim and the spokes go out to all community services. So, so that um, a restorative process can, uh, justice is only one service. I think we get, uh, we kind of can get a tendency to overvalue service. And I, I try to make the points that if you've got, the things that Sonia said, if you've got money problems, childcare problems, um, housing security problems, employment, education, and so on, and you're in a marginalized group and all this stuff. I see justice as being a luxury and we, we have to put victim centered needs at the hub. And if we can get the survival needs met by agencies in the community, then we can afford to also um, help pursue the best kind of justice from that victim's perspective. Thank you. Um, I wanna, you both talked about PrEP and I really appreciate that in both of your conversations you talked, you also emphasized the amount of time that goes into PrEP. Um, and there's a, a question here that's a little bit more specific about that. What kind of team did you utilize in the PrEP? for both parties? Do you have the same person doing it or do you use different groups of people, et cetera? Yeah, I could start with that. So in all of our processes, whether it's like RJ off the grid or VODs, uh, we use the same team for everything. Um, it seems really, really important um, that everything's being held. And we usually have, we, we usually have two facilitators. We like 95% of the time have had two facilitators. Um, and uh, I think we've had really good, amazing, nuanced conversations about how much do you share? <laughs> that is a big one, you know, like, um, I think I fall along the line of, it's not my story to tell. It, like my, my job is not to tell the story um, of either party to each other. My job is just to help them think through kind of like what might come up. Um, and sometimes that's asking sort of nuanced questions based on things that we know. Um, other, other facilitators in our kind of spectrum of facilitators do a little bit more sharing of just like things that might come up. And we've had a lot of deep nuanced conversations just about allowing our self space as facilitators to have room to kind of show up a little differently. And there are these different models out there of doing, for example, VODs um, that is like less sharing and more sharing. So that's kind of a big thing. Another piece for us is that we, um, so for example, with VODs, our VOD, our VOD director um, gets the cases and then usually her and I talk about the team of who can do it. And we're like super attentive to many things like age, race, just like who has capacity, um, who has experience. We try to partner seasoned facilitators with like more junior ones. So people are always gaining experience. Um, people can take the lead 
other folks who can learn. And then we have um, our VOD director, Martina. She also makes herself available for like just the kind of like checking stuff that's coming up for, for folks, both emotionally and also just like process wise. And she has some sort of support group meetings as well that are just about like anybody who needs kind of extra care as a facilitator. Um, and with the RJ and community stuff, we're kind of doing similar things. Like we're setting up, we're setting it up in a very similar way of team of facilitators. You know, Martina happens to be working on that now too. So it's a very similar process for us about how we put the team together. And I, I want to say that there is a distinction here between I don't know how much you're learning about transformative justice is that they have community accountability process has, has a different way of doing it where they have separate teams and then they have one main coordinator. If you've ever learned from, I think, Shira Hassan or Mimi Kim about community accountability process, they have developed it in a different way. Um, and I think it's just how different communities have found ways to do things. I have found that to be way too many people who don't have the time. Um, I have found it to be really, really helpful to have everything centralized, um, like under two people who really hold the whole process and it seems to work fine for mm -hmm. us. Yeah, Mimi will be um, speaking with us in a couple of weeks. Great, so. perfect. Yeah. So we can ask her all about that. <laughs> well, in, in our situation, similar, um, we had uh, professional social workers who did the who worked with both the wrongdoer and the survivor victim, but uh, we had different days of the week when we worked with each and we had separate entrances to our facility so that there were no chances of um, intermingling in parking lot or in, in, the, in the office. The facilitators for the conference were um, an assortment of professionals, uh, probation officers, uh, correction officers, um, uh, therapists, uh, teachers, it, a range of people with human service experience. They were trained in a two-day training and then they worked as contract workers so they were paid I think $50 to um, facilitate a conference. Our community, community accountability and, and uh, reintegration board was all community volunteers. I just, I want to add one thing because I think it's an important thing is that for us, like we really feel like this like restorative process belongs in the hand of community. Um, and like we have some therapists that are volunteers, we have some so, but social workers who are volunteers, but we're really much more kind of that like feeling like anybody is, as long as you're sort of really serious about kind of doing some work getting trained in you know and really thinking through the values and the process and being with it that it's really for anyone um and and that feels important because i think it like sometimes professional degrees have um have taken out the most skilled facilitators who are members of the community who are elders in the community who have actually already clout in the community um, who can speak something that others can't. And so we really work with folks, like when we do a training, everybody, sh anybody shows up, right? From a community person to a therapist. Um, and we just work with a process that's really about like trying to understand kind of the deeper healing and accountability work that needs to be. Sonia, at, at, at the foundation, I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. Our program, unfortunately, had to be supervised by a Human Subjects Institutional Review Board, and they considered our methods to be experimental. So for that reason, that, that is the reason that we, we focused on filling our uh, most critical roles uh, with uh, people that had a, a, a higher level of experience in human services. But I, if I, but I don't, I, I agree with you at, about how a program would evolve um, once they got out from under, you know, some yeah, of the no, that makes requirements. A lot of sense. Yeah. yeah, that you had to Because do of the community, the community board um, that was volunteer, did a great job. Uh, so I, 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 we, I fundamentally agree with you and I just had to 
do my defensive thing of saying this is why we had to do that. No, I think that's great. And I think it's important for people that are sort of new to, to this or even medium level to this, like kind of understand the difference between the nuance of what you had to do in order to study the program and like, hey, we had to like check these boxes and that's important, but it doesn't mean that if you're not one of those that you can't somehow be a part of the process. So I appreciate you ex expressing that and clarifying that. Yeah. Well, um, we are running <laughs> up against the end of time. So I just want to offer um, both of you, Sonia and Mary, if an opportunity to share any closing thoughts if you have any. Well, I mean, I have one particular closing thought and, and that is that I'm working in Arizona with the state coalition about uh, trying to have advocates and service providers reclaim justice. And we're working to, um, towards the concept of, of uh, wellness as opposed to um, the more traditional view of rape crisis centers as being places you go for treatment and for group therapy. Um, so, and we're conceptualizing justice as part of the recovery process of part of, part of um, the array of other services. So I think that that's, I gave a presentation about a program that was operated in conjunction with the criminal justice system. And I think that that's a very viable approach, but then we could only take people who, victims who chose to use the criminal justice system. If I were to do it over again, I would like to see victims have a choice that they could, that they had a justice option that did not involve the criminal justice system. Obviously it would have to be all about, you know, um, wrongdoers would have to participate uh, without any benefits like, like not getting on the sex offender registry, for example. But, um, but I, I, and I think as Sonia talked about it, adult survivors of abuse, there's so many more groups we could serve whose cases um, are just not uh, they're not going to make any progress in the criminal justice system, or it's not what people want. Yeah. So that, yeah. that would be my closing thought, is to keep on expanding victim options so that they have choice. To me, choice is how you empower people. Um, thanks, Mary. Uh, I, yeah, no, I, thanks for listening. <laughs> I think I have a lot to add. Um, I, you know, we put sort of like our trainings on pause in COVID just because I think all of us have a bit of an aversion to like Zoom trainings. Um, but we, we usually do like 12 to 15 a year. And when we're post COVID and back up and running, we, we have been doing one every year in Columbia around uh, in New York around RJ and sexual harm. We're going to be doing more. We're doing more VOD trainings. We actually think we might have a VOD training coming up in Chicago soon. But we we post it all on our website. Just if you want to just subscribe, then we will send things out, and we would love to see you in person one day, um, or on another Zoom call. So you know, we're happy to just still be around. And I put my, well, I think some folks reached out. Um, my email address is sonia at ahimsacollective.net and you can feel free to reach out if you need, if you wanted. We're also a little bit like kind of copy left about everything we have. So meaning that we're happy to share any documents or curriculum, whatever. We don't believe in owning those things. So please just reach out and I will share those with you. Thank you both so much. Um, it's always a pleasure <laughs> to talk with both of you. And we, I think we all learned so much. Um, and it's tremendous that you've taken time out of your schedule for us. I know how busy everyone is, especially now. I'd also like to say thank you to the interpreters, to our captioner, to Torres, who's been helping with the tech. This is a small shop and none of this <laughs> would be possible without all of the support. Um, to our audience, I do want to remind you that next week we'll be having Zoom meeting rather than webinar. So please, please, please read the email that I'm going to send tomorrow with information. And um, Again, thank you all, and we'll see you next week.
Thank you so much. Thank you.